Hello everybody, uh, good evening and welcome to the Eurogen webinar program. Um, we're really happy uh, to have here with us this evening uh, Prof BJ Sanger, who um, from the very beginning of the Reference Network, starting in 2017, has really helped launch the Reference Network um, and seen it grow. He's been a very active work stream leader for rare urogenital cancers, and we're just really sorry uh, that we had to lose him in that position as a result of the UK withdrawal from the EU. But we're delighted uh, that we can collaborate with experts such as Prof Sanger uh, going forward in their capacity as individual experts uh, because of their huge expertise in the area. Uh, I just want to mention also that uh, one of the uh, services that's offered by the European Reference Networks is um, we have a system, uh, a completely secure IT platform where a patient's medical information can be uploaded and the experts in our network can discuss the individual patient's case and provide advice and that could be about the surgical treatment or management of that particular patient with a rare or highly complex uh, condition that needs highly, highly specialised surgery. So we're open for business, uh, we would welcome any requests uh, for advice, so please feel free to get in touch. And without further ado now, I will uh, hand over to Prof Sanya, and it really is an honour to have you here today with us, VJ, and we're, we're really, really grateful, so thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Eurogen webinar. I'd like to thank the Eurogen management team for inviting me to give this lecture on reconstructive surgery for penile cancer. Uh, my name is VJ Sanger, consultant urologist at uh, the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. Um, the way I'm going to give this lecture today will be probably just a little bit less than 30 minutes and we'll have questions afterwards. I've decided to present you with uh, about four or five cases uh, along with some literature uh, around how we can deal with different types of uh, penile cancers, uh, including some pre-malignant lesions. So we'll go from small lesions on the glands right through to uh, treatments such as total colectomy uh, for uh, larger tumors. I have no conflicts of interest uh, in the pertinence of this lecture. Uh, the important thing for penile cancer is that we need to, that what the modern way of, of treating penile cancer is to try and treat the primary tumour uh, as well as possible so you get good oncological control, but to try and preserve uh, the organ as much as possible. And this is uh, uh, the modern approach. To start with, we have uh, uh, case one. As you will see here, a very small red patch uh, around the meatus on the glans penis. Um, this uh, patient underwent a biopsy because this had been present for several months and actually worsening. The biopsy uh, actually returned showing penile intraepithelial neoplasia. And uh, for our unit, the standard approach uh, for penile preservation is not to uh, excise this, is it, but to provide topical therapy. Topical therapy um, was given in this patient. Our standard approach is to use Aldara or Abiquamod, and this is given once daily, Monday to Friday, uh, with a sperm of weekends, and the treatment is given for six weeks. So Aldara works uh, on TOL7 receptors and activates the immune system, uh, which produces cytokines and enables the patient's body uh, to mount a response against the abnormal cells. And you'll see here that the reddened patch after several weeks of treatment um, is, has disappeared. Obviously, it does leave a scar, but uh, the, the mutilation that would be created with surgery for such a, a case uh, would be significantly worse than this. For all of our patients that have PEIN, um, we undertake HPV staining using a surrogate marker, P16. Um, this um, does help us uh, understand how to treat some of our patients. We've uh, undertaken a study which was published in the uh, International Journal of Impotence Research last year, um, in which we looked at uh, how P16 um, status would affect uh, disease-free survival. And whilst those patients with P16 positive disease have 10-month disease-free survival, and P16 negative have 7-month survival, 
what you'll see is that regardless of your P16 status, uh, the MIC model, Aldara, which is immunotherapy, either on its own or in combination with surgery, tends to work very well indeed. Uh, for those patients that have surgery alone, the recoveries rates are uh, somewhat loose. One of the important points here, uh, and I know the literature has uh, different views on this, that our paper showed that the progression to cancer rate in patients with this kind of condition is uh, almost up to 14%. Other workers have found it to be much less than this. What else can we do for more extensive small areas? So you will see here uh, a kind of PEN type lesion along with some microkeratosis on the glands, but also incorporating the uh, um, foreskin. Uh, this patient underwent biopsy uh, to uh, show the histology, but at the same time underwent CO2 laser. And you will see here that the second picture is the CO2 data. It's about two to three weeks post-treatment. So remember, the CO2 laser actually cauterizes uh, the abnormal cells off uh, to a penetration level of between two and two and a half millimeters. But it can take uh, several weeks for this to heal over. And you'll see the bottom picture here shows that the glands is healed up almost completely uh, looking normal. And this is actually a huge cosmetic improvement compared to the initial presentation. So for small areas on the glands, uh, topical therapy and laser therapy work very uh, can work very well. This is two um, papers on um, CO2 and MD YAG lasers, albeit small population, um, and the response rates are, are really quite good with local relapse occurring between 15 and 25 percent of patients. Importantly, you'll see here the progression rates uh, in these two series work with five percent. So for small areas, um, wide local excision is not always recommended. Uh, you can undertake uh, more conservative approaches. Case number two, um, this is a, a kind of animation. And we have a small lesion here on the glands, maybe between one and two centimeters. Um, one of the ways in which uh, we've developed treatment for these is rather than taking away the whole glands, is to uh, undertake an incision uh, around the subcoronal area and then bring it onto the glands, incorporating um, the abnormality. So it's a partial glandectomy. Um, so you can remove this abnormality by incising um, the area. The red dashed mark here shows uh, the second incision that can be made on the foreskin if it's still available. And if you use the inverted um, N or a U-shaped flap, you can undermine uh, the skin and enable it to be brought forward, almost encroaching up to the glands. You have to be careful that this, not, this is not too tight, otherwise you will end up with deviation of the glands to the side of the abnormality. So this is called a local advancement flap, flap which uh, is usually made out of penile shaft skin or foreskin. And this usually provides a, a reasonable um, cosmetic result, albeit that the sensation will be affected. The second way of treating this kind of uh, tumour is to undertake a partial glandectomy without a local flap and to use um, a split thickness skin graft. We usually use a, 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 an electric dermatome um, and uh, the thickness of our skin grafts are usually four tenths. And in, in such circumstances, you only need a, a one or two centimeters squared area um, for total glands resurfacing, obviously a, a larger um, specimen is required. So in this example, we'll see that the whole of the glands uh, surface has been removed, leaving um, the underlying spongiosum. The skin graft has been taken from usually the non-dominant hand side of the thigh. So for example, if you're right-handed, we always take it from the left upper thigh where there's a uh, head of skin. The skin graft is then placed on. Some people do uh, undertake mattress sutures. We've now uh, stopped doing this um, mattress suturing. We tend to just place the, the uh, graft on and ensure that we have a good tight dressing over the top of it. The healing process for this is between six and 12 weeks. It's up to a five to 10% chance that the graft may not take. In some series, it, it is less than this. 
that you can see that the cosmetic result is generally quite exceptional. Sensory wise, most patients will have some loss of sensation, but the sharp skin is not affected by this, so usually the sexual dysfunction is limited. And as you will see, uh, you know, 90% of the cases will be function adequately. If we look at two series here, um, both uh, from London centres. This is total glands or partial glands resurfacing. resurfacing. There's up to 35 patients involved in this uh, series. Um, the response and recurrence rates are quite exceptional. Um, 4% in the Shabir um, uh, Shabir study and, and no recurrences in the Hathaway study. Um, bearing in mind that uh, unexpected invasive disease can occur in, in a significant number, but I think to reduce this to a minimum, um, case uh, selection is vital. What about more invasive lesions of the distal penis? So this is uh, um, when you feel that the tumour may be T2 or potentially even T3, you can undertake a total glandsectomy. And this means taking the glands off by um, going between the plane between the uh, ends of the corporal cylinders here uh, and the glands. So it can lift the glands off, off in its entirety, leaving the urethra. On occasions, if you do think that you've uh, left the tumour behind, you can take shavings off the edge of, ends of the corporal cylinders. Usually this does not uh, encroach into the actual vascular space itself. If it does, one can close it with a 301 quill. The next step of this is to either, in more elderly patients, we tend to use the remaining penile foreskin or the shar skin, to cover this over with a spatulated urethra that we splay onto the ends of the corporal cylinders and close the skin onto. Uh, in a, for a more penile preserving and a, a better cosmetic approach, um, we uh, also put skin grafts onto the end of the corporal cylinders, um, sometimes centralizing the urethra, which I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, or to leave the urethra uh, ventrally. Again, the skin graft is taken from the non-dominant fly, uh, and uh, the cosmetic result is usually as uh, what we'd expect for uh, glands resurface. If we look at this uh, paper from Parliament Tower, we looked at 174 patients undergoing transectomies with a thickness skin graft, a 41 month follow-up. Positive margins were found in 10% of patients, and the majority of these underwent further surgery. The reoperation rate for graft loss uh, or stenosis was uh, just about 10%, but you'll see here that your recurrence free survival, your cancer specific survival, is uh, between 85 and 90%. Obviously, overall survival is much uh, worse than this because this takes into account other comorbidities, and a significant proportion of these patients will be. For more invasive lesions of the distal penis, so this is where it might take up 50% of the whole of the glands. Again, this would usually require partial penectomy. This is done by incising the corporal cylinders themselves, and usually a, a, a fingertip breadth uh, from where the tube lives. Again, even with partial uh, penectomy, once the corporal cylinders are closed, you can paste the skin graft over this. It takes very well indeed, and again, gives a very good cosmetic result. This uh, is a good opportunity to try and centralize the urethra. It's not a necessity, but does provide good cosmetic results. And you'll see here uh, pictures uh, from a procedure that was uh, actually pioneered by the UCL team, um, but Peter Malone as a Veneers group. Um, once you've undertaken your partial penectomy, you will see the midline raffe here. Um, what we would do is uh, divide this raffe to split the two corporal cylinders, which then allows you to draw the urethra up into this gap. You can see here the urethra is being suspended into the middle of the two corporal cylinders, and the tunic on the edges is enclosed 
onto the ether with a continuous suture. This is actually provides a, a good cosmetic result and also good cosmesis. We'll see here that there's the, the venal shaft is then stitched to an area uh, which would resemble the coronal sulcus, and then a bit, bit of the skin graft is placed over this. We'll see here the final result with the hiatus centralized uh, and uh, the implant. Post benectomy uh, reconstruction is uh, a difficult undertaking. It's not something that's undertaken frequently. Although I truly believe that the, the need for this uh, uh, surgery uh, should be expanded, um, I always like look at uh, cancers such as breast cancer, where it is common practice to uh, provide all women uh, with reconstructive options. But in patients that have had um, some total penectomies or total penectomies, uh, this is infrequent. What we're looking for is young, healthy people who are well motivated, non-smokers who ideally being free of cancer about 18 to 24 months. The standard approach for this, although there are many types of flaps, but the literature would suggest that the best flap to provide is a, a radial forearm free flap, which is based on the radial arch of vein and the cephalic vein. And you'll see here that uh, medially the, uh, the, the skin uh, myocutaneous flap is for the urethra and the lateral end is usually for the phallus. Once it's been harvested, some people would do this as urologists, others would incorporate plastic surgeons, but you'll see here two flaps. Uh, the smaller thin flap is rolled over to form the urethra, as you will see here, and then the larger flap is rolled over this to create the phallus. It is then placed uh, onto um, the pubic area and artery and vein are anastomosed along with the nerves. So this is a, a, a big undertaking, um, requires uh, expertise in a centre that's taking, undertaking a, a good uh, amount of this type of surgery. Um, the commonest uh, people that have this type of surgery actually those have to go gender reassignment, so it tends to occur in those types of centres. We tend to send our cases uh, down to the, our London units to this is usually done in a phased manner, um, so the phallus is made in the first instance, and then um, coronal or glands sculpting is then undertaken as a second stage. And the third stage, as you can see here, is insertion of your um, inflatable penile prosthesis, and here you will see the final result. I put this in for interest. Um, one of the, the other ways of uh, reconstructing the phallus is to consider transplantation. This has been undertaken in, uh, I think, two occasions now across the globe, um, albeit not successfully, but uh, there is a way of harvesting penises from um, patients uh, who are uh, transplant uh, donors and uh, transplant this onto a patient that's perhaps had a subtotal penectomy. Um, clearly, uh, such a patient would need to undergo immunosuppressive therapy. This is a major undertaking, and I, I would say hasn't actually been pioneered um, to complete success at this moment in time. So the aim uh, our, for our treatment is to obviously choose our patients correctly. There will be some patients who we can't reconstruct, as you'll see here on the left, but there are other patients uh, selected appropriately where we can offer good reconstructive techniques with excellent oncological outcomes. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time looking at uh, um, penile preserving data. This is uh, from Nick Watkin and Ben Ayres' group. Uh, they took 332 patients that actually had uh, margin negative sections. And they looked at the, the risk of recurrence depending on the margin. We used to say that half a centimetre was uh, appropriate, but we now know, with the help of data such as this, that uh, a margin of between one and five millimetres can be completely safe. If it's less than one millimetre, then your recurrence rates can increase to up to 15%. But as long as these patients are kept on uh, surveillance, uh, you can actually. Um, 
we operate in the that currents uh, happens. Our personal, in our personal practice, we tend to we operate on these patients uh, immediately. This is that excellent paper that uh, the Eurogen uh, group, uh, along with the young academic neurologists, um, undertook and was published towards the end of last year. This was a collaboration of nine centres that collected data on almost 900 patients with a 33 month follow up. The local recurrence rates of these patients undergoing glandectomy for small tumours was 9%. Um, so, this 9% recurrence is only in those patients that have negative margins. We then looked at whether there are any variables that could help us understand which patients are likely to recur. See here in the red box that the important variables were high grade disease and having stage T3. And they used these to uh, provide three risk categories. Low risk meant there were no risks involved. Intermediate risk was having one risk factor, such as high grade T3 disease, and high risk was having both risk factors. We divided these up into uh, groups, and here you will see. Local recurrence free survival curves for low risk, which is in red, it's a 95% chance that you will not have local recurrence. In the intermediate group, it's 87%, and in the blue group, which is high risk, it's 70% chance. So the hazard ratios increase quite dramatically up to 6.1 if you have high risk disease, and that is the risk of local recurrence. This is uh, even in the presence of a negative. So we used to think that having a positive margin did not impact on survival, but we do know from this data that it does. You will see here that overall survival and cancer-specific survival is significantly affected um, those patients that have um, local recurrence. So the drivers for our change to more conservative approach and to reconstruct the penis as best as possible is that we've become more confident in taking local margins, which are much closer. Um, despite that, we've now learned that if we have patients with high grade disease and T3 disease, that we should perhaps uh, undertake a, a less conservative surgery. And also, our patients are more aware of penile cancer, especially over the last two years. It's become uh, more, in, it's come more into the foreground, and people are happy to discuss this. And hence, their, their expectations with regards to function have uh, increased. So I'm going to finish the lecture there. Um, I thank you all for attending this evening. Um, if there are any questions, hopefully we'll be able to look at these on the uh, chat and uh, answer them in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, VJ. Are you okay to put your camera on? Yeah, excellent. There we go. We've got some questions. I think you've answered already. I've just got another one to come through as well. I don't know if you want to go through all of them or just the ones. Um, so <laughs> most of the so first of all, thank you very much for the people that have attended this, this evening. Most of the questions that well, all the questions we've had really revolve around PEIN, which I think can be quite a difficult um, disease area to to treat and. And the, the reason is that we, we all do it completely differently. So even when we use topical treatments, um, the regimes that we use, are, I think, are, are different across all the centres in the UK and also across the whole of Europe. We know that for certain. Um, we've got a, a question from Aditya Munjanat. Um, he's asking, um, how do we manage meatal PEIN or how do you manage patients that have positive meatal uh, margins? Um, in most circumstances, if it's not visible, uh, we tend to just keep a very close eye on these patients. Um, some, on some occasions, we may actually also undertake regular flexible cystoscopies to ensure uh, that we don't see anything further down uh, the urethra. Um, it's possible to treat these patients if, if need be with topical treatment if it's on the edge, uh, bearing in mind that it can be quite uncomfortable for them. Alternatively, 
you can excise uh, the edge of the meatus uh, and uh, lift the urethra up and undertake a, a kind of uh, um, meatoplasty on them. In more severe treatments, uh, we so, so more severe cases, we've actually undertaken distal urethrectomies. Um, there's two ways in which you can reconstruct these. The first way is to is to create a hypospadius and then close the glands uh, over. The downside of that is that the patient ends up um, passing their urine in quite a peculiar manner, but also it does result in a poor cosmetic result on the glands. Uh, we have undertaken it on one occasion um, uh, in our unit in that we've um, bivalved the uh, glands and put a split thickness skin graft, um, sorry, a buccal mucosal skin graft, a uh, buccal mucosal graft onto the open glands and then brought them back for a, a second stage uh, um, urethral reconstruction, which allows us to centralize the urethra. That's a complex um, operation to undertake and you do need to have a, a urethral surgeon with you. Um, obviously it depends on what kind of sense you're in. We tend to have a plastics, plastic surgical team so we're able to uh, undertake um, and buccal grafts ourselves. Um, we've got another question in here. It says, do you usually perform inguinal lymph node dissection at the same time or defer? Um, I think it's, it's if, if a patient requires an inguinal lymph node dissection and we're aware that they've got positive nodes, I think it's always best to try and do it at the same time. Um, the downside really is the logistics of, of setting up your theatre list and how much workload you have. So in a lot of circumstances, we do try to um, treat the primary cancer uh, and bring the patients back for a second sitting for their, for their lymph nodes. And I, I think that's especially the case if we're thinking about doing skin grafts. Um, I don't think there's any evidence out there, but my own personal experiences and thoughts is that if we undertake groin surgery at the time of doing it, uh, um, a skin graft, it may actually hinder um, the healing of uh, the skin graft taking. There may be other opinions on that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that um, there will be. It's a shame that, uh, that, that we can't have a, a more um, kind of uh, more of a discussion on this. So the next question is from Kenneth Manzi. He says, is there a recommended timescale for CO2 laser treatment for the diagnosis of precancerous cells? Um, I'm not sure what you're trying to ask, but usually if um, we undertake CO2 laser, uh, we, um, we normally get patients that have had a diagnosis made already. Uh, we bring them in, uh, we can usually do it under general anaesthetic, though you can do it under local anaesthetic. We take a, a cold uh, um, biopsy, usually with a three or four millimeter skin punch that dermatologists use and CO2 laser the, the whole area that's requiring treatment. And uh, that usually takes about 10 or 15 minutes, it's a pretty quick procedure, but the healing time for that, as I said in, in the lecture, can be several weeks. I don't think there needs to be any specific time gap uh, between diagnosis and treatment. Next question is from Nina Debelek. It says, do you perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy and in what clinical setting? Um, I think all the penile cancer centres in the UK and certainly those in um, uh, the Netherlands and in, in um, the Nordic countries and in Belgium all undertake sentinel node biopsies. I think it is the only way forward for penile cancer patients. Um, we tend to do this in the setting of CN0 patients, so clinically node negative, um, and uh, those that fall into intermediate and high risk disease. So these are patients that have T1, G2, sorry, T1B, G2, or greater disease that are CN0. And I think that's standard across the, all, all of our centres within the Eurogen at least. And I think that's, we don't have any more questions, Darren, I think that's it. That's it for now, yeah. So let's give, um, while we're waiting for anybody else wants to ask a question, please ask, ask now. Um, I'll give you a few, few minutes or so. Um, just to say, if you think of anything later on, you want to ask, then you'll have my contact details through uh, the invite. So please send them on to me and I can pass them on to Mr. Sangar um, for an answer. 
Um, also, just to let you know that we have recorded this webinar, so it will be available um, from tomorrow on both our GoToWebinar platform and also on uh, YouTube as well. Um, uh, we will, we've got a list of uh, planned webinars still. Um, you can look at our website to find out what those ones are. Uh, there is another one for our um, rare urogenital cancers coming up in March as well. So um, uh, you, you can find more details about that on the website, as I say, and we'll be advertising it in the next few weeks. So um, we'll send you an invite to that. So you've got it straight to your inbox. Um, okay, so we've got one more question for Kenny. So it's come through to you. Ah, so, so Kenneth Manzi is clarifying, he's, he's asking, the, he's talking about the time scale from diagnosis of a precancerous cells to actual treatment. I don't think there's any um, uh, um, required time span. We, uh, I think it depends on which country you're in. So in the UK, we usually have a, a 31 or 62 day target. Um, and I think with these patients, you need to try and treat them reasonably rapidly. Um, if you look at uh, at least our data from, from the Christie, uh, we have a, a 13 to 14 percent recurrent, uh, sorry, progression rate, and that usually happens within the first 12 to, to 14 months. So, um, if you leave these patients for too long, it can progress. There's probably an element of of there being some uh, invasive disease there that wasn't actually diagnosed, but certainly the progression rates are real. Um, so, I don't think you should be waiting too long uh, between the diagnosis and actual treatment, and that's any treatment, whether that's laser. Uh, whether it's resurfacing or whether you're using topical therapies. Okay. I think one thing I'd add, Darren, if I may, is whilst we're on, is um, obviously penile cancer is a rare uh, disease. Um, there are not a huge number of centres across Europe that undertake significant numbers. Um, the ones within the e Eurogen um, uh, camp uh, undertake good amounts of work. And if there are any people on this, um, listening to this lecture today who want to visit any of those centres obviously when when COVID allows us to um, then um, there may be funding within the E-Eurogen um, kind of setup that allows people to visit each other's centres to, to learn new techniques so um, obviously you can't come to the UK anymore but you can certainly go to all, all the other European centres. One more question come through from Romain again. I've sent it on. So Romain Daman says, uh, what is your preference for local staging uh, for, for example, T3 disease? Is it MRI or Doppler? Um, I think this is a might be slightly contentious. I think some of my peers would probably say MR scan is probably the best way forward, but with the uh, Cavaject injection, I personally don't think it makes a huge difference to me. Um, I think clinical examination is pretty good um, a majority of the time. And I think if you counsel your patients appropriately, um, so when it's probably, a, it's probably a reasonable thing not to actually image them. Um, for example, when I see patients who might be on the borderline of T2, T3, I will counsel them for a glanzectomy, but at the same time, I'll say that if during your operation, I feel that um, a glanzectomy is not going to um, cure you, then I want to take a, a, a partial penectomy. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Okay, I think that's all we've got now. So, um, as I say, people think of anything later on, they can always contact us um, and I'll endeavour to uh, get an answer. Um, now, yeah, so keep an eye on our website for future webinars, we'll be in touch about them as well and say so thank you very much for everyone for attending especially thank you to Professor Sangar for presenting today's webinar and answering these questions taking the time to do that um yeah so if there's nobody else got anything else they want to ask then we'll close the webinar good okay thank you very much everybody. bye everybody